You're listening to Why We Do What We Do. Welcome to Why We Do What We Do. I am your hungry host, Abraham. Oh, and I am your famished host, Shane. I guess we're both thinking about food a lot today. (laughs) Apparently. We're a psychology podcast. We talk about the things that people do, and one of the most core things and that people do in this case which is eat Uh uh-huh we enjoy eating i mean you and i talk about food a lot we do Uh, mostly i think because like it's always really fun to find really good vegan food yeah we recommend food and restaurants and recipes and all sorts and ingredients sometimes all sorts of things that we enjoy but otherwise we mostly talk about the things that people do and just you know a lot of what people do revolves around food in a way, so it makes sense that eventually we land on just a very... We've done some food-specific topics, like we talked about crunchy food and super tasters and other things. Yeah. But anyway, here we are, talking about food again, because why not? Well, and you know, the amount of ritual and practice and just all the things that go along around food, like there's... You could do an entire... Just an entire podcast show on food and food practices, and all the things that go along with it. And so, you know, it makes sense that we're we're tackling this at some point. In fact, there is one that does this. It's called Savor. Ah. And it, it is one that I subscribe to. There you go. And have for a long time. Yeah, it's a fun one. So I guess bonus recommend at the top of this if you're interested in a food show. I mean, they mostly look at um, just sort of talk about food items, but they also have included things like discussions of practices around food, including the one we have today. But before we get into that, I would like to say, if you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being here. We're so happy to have you. Welcome to the show. Uh, If you'd like to support what we do, then you can join us on Patreon, pick up some merch, like and subscribe, leave a rating and review, the things that like YouTubers say and, and influencers and that and all that. Also, it is very close to Happy New Year ish. I mean, it was a couple days ago, but Happy New Year. Thanks for being here at the beginning of the year, our first episode yeah. for 2024. Yeah, welcome to 2024. Please, just as a general recommendation, do not say this is going to be your year because uh, like people tend to do that and then it messes everybody else's year up. So just say, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy my year. That's perfectly fine. Everyone said that at the beginning of 2020 and look what happened. Yeah, so thanks, I guess, for that. I mean, I, somebody said that um, God sent a curse because some band released an album and that's what that was, but sure. I don't know. I digress. More importantly, it is J.R.R. Tolkien Day. Huge fan. Thank you yeah. for Lord of the Rings and all of that fun stuff. There's an accidental tie-in between that and some things we'll talk about in today's episode, which is fun. <laughs> That's fun. It is also Humiliation Day, unrelated. But I actually, so I had to look into this because I was like, what does that mean? And it's not yeah. what it sounds like. It actually has to do with humility, being humble, being sort of self taking some perspective, some self perspective and that sort of thing. So that's humiliation day. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. But it's women rock day. Uh, and I love that. Yes. It is also international mind body wellness day. So be well mm. in your mind and body. Yeah. Those two very separate things. <laughs> <laughs> we, as, as we've established right. in the show, the mind and the body are two very different things, right? It's also festival of sleep day, which sounds like, the most relaxing and most boring festival to go to, but I love that. <laughs> right. I'm like, I'm not sure about sleeping next to and with a whole bunch of strangers, but there'd be a very quiet festival. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It would be as long as everybody brings their CPAP machines and don't, and they don't snore too much. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. There'd be a, a subtle hum of snoring going on for sure. But yeah, for the most part, relative to most festivals, a very quiet festival. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is fruitcake toss day celebrating apparently the tradition of making fruitcake and then throwing it away because nobody likes it. I think we can collectively agree. Maybe we don't need to make fruitcake. Sure. Like why waste it? Why waste? Exactly. Why waste? Stop bothering. Stop. But yeah, stop bothering. It's also chocolate covered cherry day, which is fun. I like that. Yum. And you know, we've been doing this celebrating the anniversaries of things for a, a year, a little over a year, maybe. So we'll acknowledge that like what the month celebrates doesn't really change. And we'll try and switch it up and just, you know, you'll get some new ones over time. This one, I don't think we've mentioned, but a lot of people celebrate dry January. So if that's yeah. if that's you, then uh, then good luck. Enjoy your sobriety for the month. Yeah, it will do wonders for your health and brain. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, and if you're not sure of what we're talking about there. Check out our uh, episode on alcohol 
and how that uh, episode, like how that impacts you. Yes, not dry as in don't drink water or don't take a shower. Just, just <laughs> yeah, don't yeah, yeah. Liquor. You're allowed to go swimming. Yes, like you're. You could do that and definitely shower, but um, yeah, don't drink liquor. It's also Bread Machine Baking Month. What does that mean? Bread Machine Baking Month. This month-long observance is a toast to the convenience and creativity that bread machines bring into our kitchens. So. <laughs> People, okay. you can use bread machines to make all sorts of different kinds of of breads and sort of, and certain baked goods. So I, I think it is intended to inspire people to pull that dusty bread machine out of your <laughs> cabinet or whatever and uh, and and try making something for January and then put it back for a year. Uh, I mean, wash it first at least if it's dusty. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, don't need dusty bread. That's just bad. Don't need dusty bread. No thanks. <laughs> okay, we're actually not talking about bread or any of those other holidays, except kind of J.R.R. Tolkien, because in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings books and The Hobbit, hobbits are these fantastical creatures, in case you're not familiar, with a need to consume apparently just tremendous amount of calories. Sure. Hobbits traditionally and regularly consume six to seven full meals every day, Ugh. although one of them is a little bit lighter. <laughs> it is a heavy day. So... Essentially, the schedule that they follow ish is breakfast around 7 a.m., second breakfast around 9 a.m., which again is a whole nother breakfast, 11 Z's, which is 11 a.m., as one might assume, luncheon, yeah. 1 p.m., afternoon tea, 3 p.m., dinner, 6 p.m., and then supper, 9 p.m. That's a lot of food. Yeah. And also, I couldn't imagine like eating a full meal every two hours. I would be miserable. It, feels like that would be the case right yeah but i mean we're not hobbits we're not hobbits i think I, that's what i was gonna say it's like i'm not a hobbit i'm definitely more of an orc at this point in time so <laughs> the way just with how my uh my lifestyle is going just to be clear this is not a dieting episode and also don't take health advice from us because that is not in our our particular area of expertise we are just giving you information about kind of the behaviors around why people do this particular thing Yes, I don't think we have discussed yet, but what we're talking about is the tradition of eating three square meals a day, what that means, where it came from, and how it exists in other cultures around the world, etc. Like, why did we land on three meals a day? Is this a biological imperative, a necessity for being human? Uh, we'll sort of dig in on that sort of thing. And it's not a necessity for hobbits. Theirs is, is a bit more extreme than that, more than twice as many, in fact. But we're not hobbits, but it was J.R.R. Tolkien Day, so may as well. It was, that was an accidental coincidence, actually. Yeah. I'm rambling now. Let's get into our discussion. <laughs> Yes, so let's travel back in time to visit our ancient ancestors living in small packs of roaming tribes. They mostly forage for berries, nuts, and anything that grows in the ground that we can eat. Some will go out looking for animals to hunt, although they are unlikely to bring back very much on a regular basis. Hunting is not an efficient thing sometimes. Yeah, I mean, they try, and sometimes they're successful, but most evidence suggests that most calories came from food that they foraged because, well, it's not very fast. It does not run or get away very easily. <laughs> It's, e it's easy to catch a strawberry. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So we're back in time here. We're visiting our, our, our ancient peoples. They're sort of living in these small groups. They rise with the sun. And then do they gather around the fire for some coffee and eggs? Nope. They pretty much immediately start preparing for their food obtaining activities for the day, their food seeking and gathering. They need to use all of the daylight that they can to gather and store and therefore share food amongst the entire group to ensure that the group survives and thrives and is able to, if possible, grow and be successful. So their whole day is like, get up as soon as the sun is up, spend the whole day getting and obtaining food and uh, repeat next day. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, there wasn't much time for reading. There was not much time for reading or making music or making merry. Nope, 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 nope. Not until we invented some technology for this. So until we invented enough technology to ensure food was no longer scarce, everything humans did was largely oriented around constantly obtaining food. When battles were fought, it was over food. And food was a primary kind of bartering tool until currency was developed to buy food. So uh, food is a kind of a, if you hadn't noticed, a very important thing to us. And societal and government infrastructure shaped, it kind of grew and developed, and it was shaped by the efficiency of food aggregation by large numbers of people. So food, 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 food. 
Basically, <laughs> the reason that we can do the things that we do is because we've created systems and technologies to support the growth of food so the food is less scarce. Exactly. And so as food becomes less scarce, we have more time to do other things. If, yeah, if we don't have a steady and readily available supply of food, everyone's job is food. Right. Once we do have a steady, readily available supply of food, then people's time is now freed up to do other things. And we'll get to talk about more of that. Right. But thinking about this, so we're back here. As we said, they don't probably eat breakfast. What they did is they went out and they gathered and primarily then brought things back and then they would eat and, you know, again, repeat. But in the past, maybe not that far back, but did people eat three meals a day? You might be wondering, like, did people always eat three meals a day? Maybe they ate more. Maybe they ate, like, six meals a day, like hobbits. Maybe they were more like little snacks spread out, or they just kind of grazed. They ate whatever food was available. Maybe they ate less often. Maybe it was just once per day. Can we just sort of intuit a guess about what they might have done? And that sort of implies... Is the three meals a day some kind of biological imperative that we've more or less have situated our daily activities around? It's an interesting thing when you really, I guess maybe if you're so used to kind of creating a pattern of behavior around this, you don't really think about why that pattern has started to grow up unless you're us on the show and you go, why do we do that? Yeah. And that's how we end up here. We're like little kids. Yeah. Why do we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner? We're, yeah, we're kids, but we're in our, like, almost 40, and we're going, <laughs> um, why do we do that? Oh, it's almost your birthday, huh? It's the in-between time between your birthday and my birthday where you're older than me by a little bit. <laughs> that's right. But this is kind of, the, this is what we do. Like, we're trying to figure this out. And so another question we can ask is, like, whether this is based on an interval at which we start to feel naturally hungry and start to crave calories and do all that stuff. Like, there's just, there's all these questions that kind of come out of this specific behavior that we engage with. Another one that occurred to me is asking, well, what is a meal? What do we count as a meal? And also when we say meal, like something that you sit down and eat, does that have overlap with meal as in like grains and cereals and things like that? Because those are things that we sit down and eat. Actually, no, those two words developed from completely different roots and meanings. So I saw several words for this. I saw malu and malay, and this means to crush or grind. And this essentially sort of meant to talk about like grains being crushed and ground. And that was meal, like cornmeal or, you know, cereal and that sort of things, you know, mealy type foods, sure. oatmeal is an, or, you know, any grainy meal. That's sort of where that one evolved from where meal, where we're talking about sitting down and eating something what that was a, a amount of food that actually referred to time. It just meant a point in time or an occasion. It was time for something. And this largely came from Vikings as a Frisian word. And so they had the word meal, meaning essentially time that kind of started to mean time that you ate. But most, if we're just talking about what a meal means in general, most simply define meal as the consumption of of foodstuffs. Even a snack is technically a meal by the definition of you sat down or you didn't even, you don't have to sit. You decided to take time to consume food items, meal. I think there are a couple of questions I would ask in that is that I've got, I've got three. Okay. Like kind of thoughts on this i'll do my best maybe you don't have to answer it maybe we could just have a discussion around it so okay the word melee which means to crush and to grind i wonder if the the crushing grind part stayed and was used for like melee weapons because melee weapons are hmm. designed to kind of like crush and grind people i guess maybe right yeah so that's my first one Second is that I didn't realize how much I hated the word meal until you said it. <laughs> said it like 10 times in a row. You said it so many times and I realized how much I hate it. And I think I, 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 this is my own stuff where I realized that the word meal is just full of soft sounds and just like soft word, like, you know, meal versus like eat, like eat is a good word because it like, and it has that hard consonant sound. So I don't, <laughs> that's just, I've, I noticed that about myself as I got older. And so maybe that's just kind of my own thing. And the third thing is, I wonder how often when we are doing episodes that we get ads that are food related. All right. Maybe that was a food related ad, but either way, we're back. (laughs) You know, it's kind of funny you mentioned the word meal. And for me, it's actually the word snack. And you wouldn't think because the hard consonants that are in there that they would be so unappealing. And I don't know what it is, but 
It's something about that word that I just hate. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's the fact that it's been um, co-opted by a generation of people calling other people snacks. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Okay. Getting back on track. We've sort of been moving through history, uh, all, albeit in sort of jumps and starts and fits and spurts and etc. All the words. Before any kind of industrialized industrialization of food production, what you could mostly expect in these tribes, um, these, these sort of roaming tribes, was that they ate when they were hungry if they had food that was available. Right. So this may have been something like those six small snacks or the six small meals per day, or <laughs> it might have looked more like one large meal per day. Where they were and their access to food and their group's food demands, whatever they might be, would essentially inform how much and when they ate. Most likely, in most instances, it was probably about one large meal per day. Right. But... Essentially, they ate when they were hungry, and when they were hungry was influenced by a variety of factors we'll talk about in a bit. Before artificial light, people had to rise and set with the sun. Uh, and as a side note, they likely slept longer than we do now. So, uh, you know, thanks capitalism for making it so that we have to sleep much less than our ancestors did. Yeah, we have all this light now, and it just allows us to not get any sleep, which is killing us. <laughs> I don't know. We live longer. Uh, but I guess maybe there's no sab- saber to tigers either. So I, we have a different we have a different um, set of circumstances. Fair. <laughs> Ancient Romans. This came up a lot in looking up a lot of information about this episode. Ancient Romans ate about once per day around noon. They called this dinner. They considered it gluttonous to eat before <laughs> or in addition to that meal. So essentially, they just had their one noon ish meal that they that they called dinner. And it was believed that eating at other times was not only gluttonous, but also bad for healthy digestion and just your overall well being. So they were essentially a nation of people doing intermittent fasting. (laughs) Yeah, that's wild. Now, in the Middle Ages, largely influenced by religion, people were not supposed to eat before mass. So again, they would likely eat a large meal in the middle of the day, possibly a lighter snack toward the end of the day before bed. So you kind of had two opportunities to eat during the day, but it was based on religious practices. Yeah, because they would set aside their time to do all their worship in the morning. It would take almost all morning, and then they would eat afterward. And that was their primary sort of of middle-of-the-day meal or snack. The word lunch that we now use to refer to, and at least in English, the meal that people consume in the middle of the day, may have evolved from a word called nunchen, meaning none sort of referring to noon. So I was actually wondering, maybe it's supposed to be pronounced (laughs) nunchen? Hmm, yeah. And some have suggested that the word lump referred to something like uh, a piece of bread or cheese that you might eat for a snack, and that they combined lump with nunchen to give us luncheon, which is Hmm. where we started to get lunch from. I also don't like the word lump, apparently. (laughs) It's the soft consonants for you, I think. (laughs) I think that one has more of a historical context for me. I think uh, I got so tired of hearing the President of the United States of America sing lump on the radio when we were kids. Like, I just can't, Mm. I can't do it anymore. (laughs) Now, dinner was a common word for lunch. And sometimes lunch is used in place of the word dinner to refer to a large meal in the evening. It doesn't happen as often today, I don't think, but it is something that uh, you'll find every now and again where lunch and dinner are used interchangeably. Have you ever used dinner to refer to like a midday meal? No. (laughs) Boy, your expression was really good there. (laughs) How dare you? (laughs) Don't be ridiculous. Do you or your family use supper to refer to like an evening meal? No. So I actually, this is something that as I was growing up, I, I understood supper to be a very Southern term. And my family is not a very Southern family. Like my mom was raised in Daytona, but my dad's from Pittsburgh. Mm. Like I grew up in kind of like a very Northern style family and so supper never came up at all but i think i don't know if that has anything to do with anything we just never use the word supper okay got you yeah my dad did sometimes uh use that word but i was never clear if he meant dinner or something different from that it seemed like (laughs) maybe he was expecting another meal after dinner 
I wasn't totally sure, or maybe it was like a light meal that preceded dinner. Yeah. It does seem like people use it interchangeably with dinner and almost always to refer to, refer to a nighttime or evening time meal of some sort. Yeah. That makes sense. I could see that. Yeah. It's a word. It's not something that came up in my family like at all. Yeah. I don't definitely don't use it now, but I'm sure some people still do. Yeah. Hey, listeners, if you do, you should write it and tell us which one you prefer and how you use it. Yeah. I love that. And if you ever say dinner to mean a midday meal instead of lunch, that would also be interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Tell us your family habits. Shane might mock you quietly, though. I will <laughs> not mock you on the air for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay so we've talked about lunch we've talked about dinner a little bit and we'll get more into how those got shaped up the idea of breakfast as an early first meal was actually very uncommon throughout history that was the most recent addition to the scheduled meals per day routine that we've gotten into do you think that's why there were so many wars before is because people were <laughs> angry in the morning and they didn't have the greatest meal of the day which was breakfast they're like, I didn't get coffee and eggs and bacon. Like, I am going to kill whoever is nearest <laughs> I'm gonna me I'm going to kill right somebody, now. yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, for, for most, the largest and probably only, or at least most important meal was dinner, meaning lunch. So, that noon, uh, that noon meal was the most important meal of the day. Right. And the particularly wealthy made a large affair out of their dinners with customary rituals and a lavish, rambunctious party atmosphere. Again, dinners standing in for lunch. Yes. Obviously, most people, that was about when they were going to be eating. But the workday also did start to shape this. So as we moved more and more into what might be considered a workday, where people worked to earn a wage to pay for various things, their houses, their rent, their their meals, etc., or going to school was another one, actually, because as, as schooling and education started to become an institutionalized and regularly scheduled activity, people then went to school almost like a work day. They would leave the house at a time. They'd go there for a time. They'd come home. And when they are working or going to school, they might take a break around the midday point in which they, they would take, depending on where you're at in time and geographically, they would get between 15 minutes and an hour before returning to their activities. Obviously, some places have much longer. They'll take two-hour breaks as pretty standard fare around for the midday. But around the time that all of this was shaping up, that was about what the midday break looked like. Yeah, and if you're at Amazon, they've completely eliminated this, so don't worry about <laughs> That's it. That's right. No <laughs> breaks, no lunches, no dinners, no anything. <laughs> we only ship food. We don't eat it here. Now, uh, this actually took the emphasis off of lunch and dinner as the primary meal, and instead the later meal, supper, when people would have time to prepare and eat most of their calories, became heartier and larger. Essentially, dinner, lunch, was pushed back further and further into the evening until it was the last final large meal of the day. But people weren't going to just not eat all day until dinner. That was unacceptable for many people. Right. And so that's where they got this sort of luncheon thing. They would have a lump of bread or cheese um, that they would Ugh. have a break during their work day <laughs> and they would consume whatever it was. We'll get to talking about that a bit more in a second. But in the 17th century, it started to become popular among the wealthy to have coffee or tea with eggs for breakfast or other things. Like there was plenty of things that they might have, but it was during the 17th century that they started to actually consume some of their calories earlier in the day upon waking and sort of with the sunrise. It's wild to think that coffee, like, I mean, not that coffee isn't a luxury, but like thinking of it as being like an actual, like, Something that people could only access if you had a lot of money. Yeah. Now you can get like Folgers crystals and and just kind of dump that into a cup of water and you're like, hey, here's coffee, I guess. <laughs> it's just kind of interesting to think that uh, how much we've evolved and how much like coffee has become kind of like a, a common commodity compared to what it used to be. Yeah. At least right now. We'll see. At least right now until we farm all of that out. So be mindful yep. of the coffee you drink. Now, as industrialization increased in the 1800s, it became necessary for workers to have some food before going to their day-long jobs. So they found that people weren't as productive if they had worked through the entire day without sustenance, uh, and it made more financial sense to give workers a break in the middle of the day to eat. And also, some of the employers could sell their employees lunch, thereby recouping their losses, those sneaky bastards. So thanks capitalism for that where they uh, are uh, you know figuring out ways to just kind of bleed the worker dry. That's yeah. 
Yeah. It was like, all right, fine. You'll get a lunch break because then you're more productive in the afternoon. But on your lunch break, you're going to pay me to eat food. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's blatantly apparent what was going on there. Yeah. Okay. So we're moving up into the sort of 1800s, 1900s. We're getting around there. Technology also found more ways to preserve food and make it easier to obtain. You know, these factories could start to produce food en masse from just raw ingredients. Cereals were starting to be developed that would last a long time and were easy to prepare. The best food? (laughs) Yes. There was rapid heating and processing. In the early 1900s, we got toasters so that people could easily, you know, toast food and very quickly. Things like, obviously, bread for toast. Food storage got better. We started to have refrigeration and other preservation techniques that would keep food longer. And packaging, as it started to, be, to develop, also to a, you know, to a small extent early on, meant that people could essentially quickly obtain easy-to-consume meals right away early in the morning. So it became easier to have food be available because it lasted longer. It could be protected from the ex, you know the air and other things externally, and it could be eaten you know almost on the go. It could just be a quick thing that you could get to those calories right out the door, if you will. Yeah, I bet you didn't know this was a history of the Lunchable, folks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what all this is leading up to is like it's not three meals a day. We're just uh, it's the secret history of the Lunchable and how we got here. The secret. History. That's really good. <laughs> Now, uh, by the 1900s, not only was breakfast widely adopted by most, it was now being called the most important meal of the day, which I absolutely subscribe to that idea. That is easily the most important meal of the day for me, mostly because it has coffee. It is my favorite for sure. If I could only choose one meal a day to have, it would be breakfast. This is definitely a thing. I was listening to a podcast where they were talking. Um, it was a band coming out of Japan. Who, it was a hardcore band coming out of Japan who was touring. A Japan. A Japan. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, they had ranked all their favorite fast food, the American fast food when they got here. Oh, fun. And the, he said that it was dishonorable. He specifically said on the show, it was dishonorable to eat breakfast food at night. So he refused to eat breakfast food at night. And I just thought it was really fascinating to be like how he was just absolutely disgusted that anybody would even consider eating breakfast food at night. Wow. There is actually, I didn't think about this in preparing for this discussion, but it it would probably be at least worth a mini episode down the road to talk about why we eat certain foods at certain times. Again, thinking about, about going back in time, like people ate whatever they could eat whenever they could eat it essentially. Right. And so the idea that we've now morphed into a point where not only do we have specific foods that are designated for times of the day and specific meals that are regimented and scheduled for those times, but now it's dishonorable not to adhere to that (laughs) schedule is so many leaps and bounds beyond the sort of biological necessity of trying to sustain oneself and, and yeah. feed, you know, provide nutrients <laughs> to one's own body. Yeah, I'm not sure if he was saying it in jest, but it was very funny to think. And he was like, sure, pretty adamant about never like his favorite restaurant in the United States was Denny's, but he would not eat Denny's at night. <laughs> well, and I've heard people make a big deal out of out of the like breakfast for dinner as as sort of maybe a one time big event thing that you might do because apparently you can only have eggs, bacon, toast, or cereal in the morning, and at any other time. It's an abomination. And if you were to have like spaghetti for breakfast, it'd be like, what are you doing? You crazy monster. Don't do that. (laughs) Those are all arbitrary rules. They're all rules made up by humans. (laughs) Honestly, one of my favorite breakfasts is like a big salad with just every vegetable you can think of in it. I just throw everything in there. And that was a really, really good breakfast. Also, make it spicy AF. Yeah, that's. I also eat candy for breakfast. Like I have no, I have no qualms with that. Like I mean, a muffin, like muffins. Like I, le- I had a chocolate chip muffin for breakfast candy. this morning, uh, which is straight up candy. Yeah, it's cake. Is I just had cake for breakfast. So like it's it's there are no rules. Like we make rules. There are no rules. Yeah, there are no rules. But unfortunately, there are ads. Okay, let's let's get back to our discussion here on the evolution, if you will, of the meals per day paradigm as it currently exists. So we talked about the fact that breakfast is sort of in the early 1900s, early 1920s and 30s ish now being deemed the most important meal 
of the day. And we are now well past the point at which artificial lights have come into our world and played a huge role in how much more we can extend our activities because we can we can stretch lighting well past the point at which it would naturally be available via the sun. And so that has also provided an opportunity for more food preparation. And in addition to that, we've got more food preparation technologies. We've got, we're getting into ovens and microwaves and different stove tops and all kinds of technologies that can, that can prepare food in different ways and dinner or lunch (laughs) started getting pushed well past Again, dinner is now the evening thing. Getting well past sunset, where it was most likely happening most of the time, and into the evening, and sometimes quite late into the evening. Well, and and with all that, I think it's really important to recognize that, like, as we develop new technologies to make it easier to prepare food, it frees up more time to do other things. Like, that's why we're all so busy all the time, is because we don't have to spend all of our time gathering wood to make a fire and to start the fire and to burn the fire and do all those things to just make the meal that we've been hunting for all day. Like we have freed up right. so much time just by developing technologies to make our lives easier. But it's just a fascinating thing to think about. And maybe you never thought about that. Maybe you're going, Oh, this toaster sucks. It's like, well, you would have had to leave that bread out in the sun to toast for <laughs> hours. So be happy. With a magnifying have a- glass over. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, be happy that you have a toaster. The ritual of a a midday lunch as a break from work became the standard in industrialized countries to the point of being thought of as essentially necessary to the routine. So essentially what's happened is lunch, midday lunch is now built into schedules and built into kind of the structure of the day because it has become and, and also has become a legal right. True. In a lot of places, because it has become such an important part of that structure for the day. Yeah, so this is how we got three meals per day, largely through a combination of the four horses of the apocalypse, (laughs) industrialization, (laughs) exploitation, religion, and capitalism. (laughs) Nailed it. That's the end of the show. There's nothing funnier than that. That's the best thing that I've ever heard. Thanks. (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, I mean, those are the forces that essentially drove the conditions under which we were sort of forced to make that choice where the three meals more or less fit around those schedules. And that just became ritual to the point that we then saw the three meals as essential to our daily activities. Right. And so this this regimented schedule of eating at designated periods of time of, of these named eating events, breakfast, lunch and dinner or supper, was even thought to be an outcome of sophistication and progress by elitist Europeans and therefore considered emblematic of a civilized culture. And here's where colonization comes in. Right. So like everything yep. else, this tradition of three meals per day has some roots in racism. Yep, and essentially as colonization spread that was imposed upon the indigenous peoples of the places that they went, basically saying, in addition to all the other things that we're bringing with us, I mean, religion and government and money and jails and various, a variety of other cultural things, they also came in and said, we eat three meals a day at these times because we are these sophisticated, highly evolved creatures. You will also do that now and sort of forced that onto the indigenous peoples and other cultures around the world. Speaking of other places around the world, we can actually talk a little bit about what this looks like around the world. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is breakfast is racist. (laughs) No, I'm just saying the three meals a day. Yes. The expectation, the expectation of uh, the expectation of other cultures eating three meals a day because it is the civil quote unquote civilized way to do things is a significant problem. Yes. (laughs) Imposed by colonists. Just to be clear. Yeah. Somebody's going to take that sound bite and be like, oh, lunch is racist. (laughs) So Western European colonization has infected a huge amount of the world. If you hadn't noticed that. And if you hadn't noticed that, then maybe you're part of the places that did that. But the practice of three meals per day spread when you're wherever Europeans went. So If Europeans showed up somewhere, three meals a day ended up being part of the huge amount of changes that were implemented in those areas. Often, yeah. So they found groups that didn't have the three meals per day. And again, those other European traditions, they considered them savage, barbaric, uncivilized. And the Europeans believed then that it was well within their rights to impose European culture on on those others, including the three meals a day idea that they'd been practicing. 
when we say Europeans, I think it's really important to say like Western Europeans. True. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly Western Europeans, like mostly white Europeans, because if you go to right. Italy, there like there's like some pretty nice breaks during the day that are like not necessarily like a three meals a day type of thing. But we'll, we'll kind of unpack this a little bit. Yeah. Most countries around the world practice a version of three meals a day. The Czech Republic, Dominican Republic, Laos, China, pretty much all European countries. And of course, in South Korea and specifically South Korea had a 2014 cooking TV show called Three Meals a Day. So it, it's made it so far. It's made it out into the peninsula of uh, South Korea. Some countries have four meals per day, Greece and Argentina, which have included essentially an afternoon snack that's sort of a post-lunch meal between lunch and dinner. Yeah, and some countries only do two meals a day. Jamaica and parts of Syria specifically look at just having two meals a day um, regularly. Yeah. So as we said, there's really, you might have thought like we get hungry maybe approximately every five-ish hours. Yeah. But that's actually not really the case. There's no biological reason to have three meals a day. Some have actually pointed out that sticking to that routine of three meals a day might increase the likelihood of obesity and overeating by prompting people to eat when they're not actually hungry or to eat more than they would just because it's sort of supposed to be a meal, whatever that is. Yeah. And many have even suggested that smaller meals throughout the day might work better for some people or just a couple of large meals in the day might work better for some people and have them make more intentional and healthier choices about their own food and their own habits around food rather than saying like, these are the designated times and rituals around specific meals. And the shift in circumstances around globalization has also more or less started to erode the tradition of three meals per day. So in countries with abundance, more and more millennials and Gen Zers are skipping breakfast or opting for more on the go foods and affordable snacks when they are available. So the kind of quote unquote traditional structure of three meals a day is starting to kind of become a thing of the past. Yeah. Even in places where it was largely developed by those people, right. It's starting to crumble a little bit. And because of this, there's just been an enormous increase in prepackaged snacks and highly preserved foods and the market for that because of many factors. One is the cost of food in restaurants is so high. The inconvenience and lack of time to prepare food in this extraordinarily busy world that people are expected to keep up with and their jobs and school, etc. And of course, just then the convenience of having some kind of thing that you can quickly tear open a package, eat a good, you know, 120 or 200 calorie thing and keep moving and you spend very little time on it. And so it's really removed food as the operative force that has people making decisions about what they eat and what it means to spend any time eating or doing anything around food. It's really just a means to an end for a lot of these people because of the circumstances we find ourselves in for better or for worse. Right. And so the traditional meal structures that we've been talking about, quote unquote traditional, and all of those things that we're, we've been discussing, it's breaking down as the indelible weight of capitalism drives ever more efficient productivity and drive down the affordability of food. So like we're finding that people are, because of their circumstances and because of how much they're working or because of what the expectations are, they're preparing less meals, they're grabbing more on the go foods, they're not going to restaurants as much, they are... It's a very non-linear, non-structural way to eat food now. Yeah, I kind of had the thought that this sort of conservative interpretation of all of this is like all these darn millennials and these young people and these these liberal waves are eroding our sacred institutions like three meals a day. And at the same time, the thing that they worship, capitalism, is pretty much the thing that's driving that change. Right. So it's sort of like <laughs> you're pointing in a mirror, friend. You're right. Like it's it's they don't realize that not that these things are, I guess, mutually exclusive. They're not. There's not like a Venn diagram where it's capitalism three meals a day or like a perfect circle over each other. It's not, it's sure. certainly not that. No. But like the circumstance in which the people are changing their eating habits is based on and based around the circumstances that capitalism has created. Right. Perfectly said. I think that is a really kind of unique thing to think about when, you know, when people talk about like, Oh, capitalism has nothing to do with this. Well, actually, right. When you think about it, you know, I mean, how many of us and I, dear listeners don't take this as a slight because I have done this myself, but how many of us have skipped a meal at, at work because we were either too busy to eat and we just grabbed a quick snack and we're eating during like a, maybe a meeting or something like that. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not many of us are taking lunch breaks anymore. Yeah. And that's because of maybe the demands of our jobs. Maybe it's the demands of, of our lives, whatever it is, we're skipping meals, not because it's a necessity and they're not because we want to, but maybe it's a necessity because of our, our current circumstances. Yeah. I know a lot of people who they are like, I have to work through my lunch or I want to work through my lunch so that I can get this thing done. Or, you know, just the other day I had, I had so much to do that I decided it was best that I just work through my lunch Mm -hmm. and the expectation we have, you know, people are expected to answer emails and, you know, responds to all of these extracurricular things that are part of their job, but for which they're not being paid and yet are expected to perform. And so employers have gotten really good at figuring out how to essentially get a bunch of extra free work. And that means that people are making the choice to skip through many of those meals and the opportunities they would have to eat, or they're opting for something really quick, like just a snack. That's a prepackaged thing. They can quickly unwrap and consume. Yeah. And so I, you know, I'm wondering, you know, if you're skipping meals, if you're also planning to skip these ads. Okay, we're back from those ads that you you may or may not have heard, and <laughs> we're going to <laughs> dig in a little bit more on talking, I think, understanding psychologically and biologically the pressures of three meals a day, what that means, and how we sort of respond to it and are shaped by it. Yeah. Now, people are naturally going to go hungry or get hungry after enough time has passed without consuming food. I mean, they're, they're, and everybody has a different kind of time frame for that based on a lot of different things. But context and history significantly impact the the extent to which we start to feel hungry at certain intervals. So, you know, for me, I eat breakfast at about eight this morning. Right now, it is about twelve thirty, and by the time by the time we're done recording this, I will probably eat lunch. So, like, I I can go about that much time where I'm like, okay, I can eat. You know, what helps though is I drink a lot of coffee, so I don't eat as much as maybe somebody my size might look like they eat. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, I mean, our our bodies essentially respond to the pressures we place upon them. People who have more muscle and who generally expend more energy will feel hungrier more often in general. However, people who eat during more spaced out intervals, maybe only in the morning or only in the afternoon, sort of that intermittent fasting thing, they will actually stop experiencing hunger as a significant motivator during non-food designated times after only a few days of that routine, even if they are active and more heavily muscled, which is to say we just get used to whatever routine we get into. And it can be uncomfortable for a few days, but you'd be amazed at how quickly you settle into it. So if you're someone who constantly skips breakfast, you kind of will stop feeling hungry around the time that you would be having breakfast and you won't start to feel hungry until you're getting closer to the time that you'd normally have lunch. Now, you can't push that out indefinitely. You can't just go days without food and not expect to feel hungry during that. But in terms of like a 24-hour period, thinking about our sleep and whatnot, we're essentially going to respond to what we've sort of put ourselves through, what we're used to, what our routine has taught our bodies to do. It's interesting because like I think about like my routines versus like routines of everybody in my house and everybody eats breakfast at a different time if they eat breakfast at all. My son eats breakfast later. I eat earlier and my wife and daughter do not eat breakfast at all. Right. So our history around routines of food as well as the current surroundings, that's all going to drive our food seeking behavior as much as any hormone or any other physical features. So it's kind of like they say this a lot with like drug use certain types of drugs. Like if you want to have a good experience around certain types of drug use, then it's all about set and setting. Right. And food is absolutely like that too. So when we are around delicious looking, well-prepared foods and we're in a comfortable space, we might start feeling hungry and we're going to eat or at least choose to eat simply because the opportunity presents itself. I mean, there's many of us who have eaten because we're comfortable and maybe we're bored. And so we're just going to snack on some stuff when we, uh, when we want to. And when we're busy, we're engaged and we're happy. We might forget to eat altogether way past the point at which we would normally eat food. So there's a lot of things that happen that are not just physiological, but, or biological, but also circumstantial that are going to influence the way that we eat and how much we eat. Completely. And you think about cultural celebrations also dictate how, when, where, and what kinds of food is chosen and at what intervals. If you might think of fasting for Lent or Ramadan or feasts for Thanksgiving or Christmas, right? those are times that will also change the circumstances that are of our sort of food choosing and seeking behaviors. Yeah. At the time of this recording, we are recording on Christmas Eve. So I know we said uh, Happy New Year, but tomorrow night I go to my parents' house and we're going to have Christmas tacos because we have Christmas tacos every year and it's great. Love that. Oh my God. Yeah. 
It's amazing. Good and my you. dad, who was never, never stoked about me being a vegetarian, makes a vegetarian vat of like gr- crumbles for the tacos. And it's so good. So I'm, I'm super stoked. Nice. The workday largely shaped the opportunity for eating, thus giving us breakfast and late dinner, which was once lunch. But biology more or less forced a break in the middle of the day for lunch. So if these systems change, so too will our food seeking. So what will end up happening is if, you know, our schedule shift or change or alter, then we're going to eat meals at different times a day based around what our productivity schedules are. Yeah, we eat three meals a day because it's expedient. It's baked into the fabric of our culture for many around the world now. And we start practicing it at a very early age. Otherwise, we would likely eat at some other interval possibly a very irregular one. We might just eat a little bit every few hours would actually not surprise me at all with the abundance of food that people would choose to just space out a bunch of small meals rather than plan a few large ones and have probably relatively equal calories in their overall daily intake. Right. But like, this is just the system we're currently in and that very well could change at some point. So it is totally circumstantial, as you said. And, you know, people do have really complicated relationships with food for different reasons. And and I think it's important to kind of recognize that and provide awareness around that. But as far as the three meals a day go, it's a completely arbitrary schedule that we have created and have lived by for generations. And that's and that's really the only reason why we're still doing it. Right. Yeah, I think that's what we have to say about three meals a day and why we eat three meals a day and why we might yeah. not eat three meals a day. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we get to uh, recommendations and whatnot? No, I think that covers that. Perfect. Well, if you're joining us for the first time, we always like to recommend some things that we feel like people might also enjoy that we like. Before we do that, we need to thank the people who help make this show possible, which is our lovely Patreon people, Mike M., Megan, Layla, Mike T., Justin, Kim, Joshua, Brad. Brad, Stephanie, Olivia, Brian, and Ashley. Thank you all so much for your continued support. If you would like to join that list of people so I will say your name too, you can head over to patreon.com slash podcast. Your help really means everything to us, and we really appreciate your generosity yes. and your kindness around this. So thank you. And if you go over there, you also get some extra stuff. You get some like early episodes and add free episodes and notes and whatever, you know, uh, tier you sign up for. You might get to get some bonus things. So consider heading over there if you'd like to support us. Otherwise, you can leave us a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Tell a friend. And you can also subscribe. Or you can go to our merch store and pick up some merch there that says why we do what we do, which is just a a perfect gift for anyone for any occasion, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I also couldn't do this show without my team of people that help make this happen. Um, Writing and fact checking from Shane and myself, production and music from Justin Greenhouse, and our social media coordinator is Emma Wilson. And of course, thank you all so much for listening. Now, before we let you go, we are going to recommend some things. We certainly are. Recommendations. I am recommending a TV show. It is sort of anthology TV show, meaning that every season is its own self-contained story. It does not reference a previous season. You do not need to have ever seen another season to make sense of the current season. But this current season always tells a story that unfolds over 10 or so episodes. The current season is season five, and it is actually not quite done yet, but I am just loving it. I think it is so super well done. But it has a fantastic cast. Juno Temple, who is famous for for uh, Ted Lasso. It's also got Jennifer Jason Lee, John Hamm, and uh, Joe Keery, who is from uh, Stranger Things. So a uh, really nice. fantastic cast, really well done story. Been really enjoying it. I know it's available on Hulu and maybe some other service, but that's where I'm currently watching it. So if you're interested, go check out Fargo season five. And honestly, most of the seasons are pretty good. So um, the first season was very, very good. But yeah, I like, I like a lot of them. So go check out Fargo season five if you're into sort of dark, Comedy, drama, things, crime, noir, yeah. not noir, but yeah, that sort of thing. This is a continuation of the movie, right? The Coen Brothers movie, Fargo? Right. So the first season was essentially a retelling of that movie, but way stretched okay. out so it could en- encompass several episodes. I think that one was shorter, like five or six episodes. And then every season since has been essentially its own completely different story. Okay. But it has the same sort of feel to it. Okay. They're basically like saying like, what if we told Fargo, but with this as the setting or with these as the characters. And so there's a very similar vibe to the whole thing, but yes, it did start because of the, of the Coen brothers movie. I like that. That's so fun. 
I'm going to recommend a food stuff. So I was recently in New York and I got to enjoy. So I'm not one to kind of like get on to social media and then follow a trend that's on social media. But this was one of those ones when I got to New York, I was like, I got to try this because it, the food just looks delicious. It's like one of those like mm. ridiculous food things. This place is called Angelina Bakery, and there is a okay. uh, a bakery in Times Square, and there is one in Hell's Kitchen. So they're not too far from one another. Okay. This place is, if you get on Instagram and you see these giant croissants that are like, they look like circles, they're wheels, yeah, and they're like stuffed full of deliciousness, that's what this place is. So I got to go and I got to try the pistachio croissant that is a, it's called a pistachio rolling croissant and it is like a circle and it's full of like a pistachio cream and it's like dipped in white chocolate with like pistachio sprinkled on it. And it was the best croissant I've ever had in my life. Wow. Got to try some of their focaccia bread, got to try all the stuff. And, uh, you know, as somebody who likes just breakfast stuff and food stuff and bread stuff, this was the place to be. And the coffee was really good. I have dreamt of this place every day since I left New York. <laughs> wow. So it was that good. They do pasta. They do cold sandwiches. They do pizzas. They also do uh, bombolones, which are like these big puffy Italian donuts that are like full of like this different, like different creams and stuff. Like they have a Boston cream and they have all that stuff. So it was delicious. And I think about it a lot and I can't wait to go back or maybe order food from them and have it shipped in because it was that good. Man. Oh, well, that is quite the sell. Um, all right. So Angelina <laughs> yeah. Bakery. If, yes. if you're in the, the vicinity of New York or maybe they have other locations and are, are looking for a bakery, you could certainly do worse than uh, Angelina Bakery. Yeah. Arguably, you couldn't do better based on that sales pitch. <laughs> so <laughs> The best thing I had. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. Well, I think that is all that I have. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for recording with me today. Shane, is there anything else that we need to add or that you would like to say before we wrap up? I think the only thing I have to say is happy eating. <laughs> Very good. All right, then this is Abraham. This is Shane. We're out. See ya. You've been listening to Why We Do What We Do. You can learn more about this and other episodes by going to www.wwdpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope you have an awesome day. So before artificial light, artificial light people, (laughs) this is why commas are important. (laughs) Artificial light people. I like the idea of like uh, a fluorescent person who's also been made, you know, manufactured. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just a fluorescent robot person.